Hello everyone, I'm Reverend Carla and welcome to Spirituality Matters. Let's settle in to find that space between here where I am and there where you are. And be reminded that the holy transcends our physical bodies and our time together is just as sacred and meaningful as if we were sitting beside one another. Okay, let's get started. Today's podcast is titled Turning Toward the Light. And I always think it's wise to prepare you for our time together if what is arising may require some gentleness and some space. And today is one of those days, beloved. This topic may have an element of unpacking that will require what uh, a beautiful phrase that Mackenzie gave me, pause for breath. I say this to encourage you to be mindful of your tasks as you listen to this podcast. It doesn't mean that you can't multitask, but it also may invite you into a deeper conversation with yourself when you're able to sit and think about or process some of the things that we'll discuss. And it's also, this is one of these podcasts or opportunities to use this as a contemplative practice. So many of you ask me about what does a spiritual journey look outside of organized religion, where you're looking for components to put into your life. And so often I encourage you to pick up a journaling practice because even though you might not actually enjoy the physical part of writing, you can also do it on an iPad or anything like that, or you could also speak it. There is an invitation for the soul to have a voice into your life by taking what we discuss and asking yourself, how is this applying to you? How is it speaking to you? So this week is the keeper of one of the most sacred days of the year. This day impacts all of humanity in some way. Now, you may be assuming that I am speaking of Christmas, and I am not. I am speaking of the winter solstice. But please, do not consider me heretical if I'm not, as, because I am someone with Christian roots. So Chris, Christmas holds a sacred for me. It is indeed a holy time as it does for the millions of Christians around the world. But we also know that it has become heavily commercialized. And there will be many households that will be celebrating Christmas morning and never even acknowledge that this is a holiday that was set up by the church to celebrate Jesus' birth. Now, I want to just just divert a little bit and talk about that because that is important because we really don't know the actual date of Jesus' birth. There is not consensus among scholars as to how December 25th came to be the holy day of Jesus' birth. What we do know is that the Bible is silent on this. We do not have the date. The earliest Christians would not have celebrated this date. This didn't even happen until, I think, I believe the third or fourth century in Christian history. And some will say, well, perhaps it just arose out of divine providence that we became aware that December 25th was that date, that somehow miraculously over time, we just began to know that that was the date that we needed to honor Jesus' birth. But in all due respect, that is so weak for me. There's just too many other things in history, in Christian history, and and in looking at the context that tells us that there was more in line with the reasoning behind the church, why the church leaders chose that date. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. So what had happened over time is that the church leaders would piggyback on an ancient ritual that would disrupt the focus of the people who were really honoring earth-based rituals and try to direct that tension or that attention or that passion and that devotion for those rituals into the church. So in other words, that's why you see holidays around the solstices and the equinox because the people understood the power of the the seasonal cycles and how it was uh, their source of life. So the earth 
the, the churches mandating their participation in the church rituals was very easy for them to do because they held the power. It very much was blended with government power as well. So you could mandate participation in the church rituals and also create punishment for participating in the earth-based rituals. And so that then a lot of those started to fall away and go underground. And that's when you started to see things that uh, called them heretical, of the devil, pagan rituals and things like that when there, were, there was nothing uh, even close to that, but there started to have a negative connotation because that so also served the church narrative. So the reason that this starts, this also starts another part of, and, and again, I don't offer this as necessarily a negative connotation towards the church. This is just history. When we start to own that history, when we start to understand the foundational roots of how Christian, Christianity or any other religion took form, then we can start to embrace our ancestral heritage. At the same time, we're looking at how the church congruently came along as we continue to evolve and grow as, as humanity grew. So it also allows us to take a step back and start to embrace some of the wisdom that our ancestors knew about the importance of honoring this creation, which again is part of the a miracle of the divine creation. Why wouldn't we honor it? Why wouldn't we pause to be a part of this? So the church though, how, however, they were trying to figure out ways to, to control people that were largely uneducated. They couldn't read. They were heavily taxed already by the government authorities. So now the church needed to be funding, funded, and they, they created these monumental cathedrals and, and, and places for worship. And the reason why they did that was because they wanted it to look as foreboding and uh, sacred as if you were approaching God. So then they would separate themselves from the look of the basic uh, peasant home, if you will, where most people could barely keep a roof over their head. And you turn to look at the church, then of course you would be honored to be a part of something that was so elegant, eloquently um, laid out and also rich in history and, and rich in all the things that, that would adorn those, um, those cathedrals. They also controlled the wisdom because at that time, the, the Bible was only known, when the Bible was originally written, it was in Hebrew and Greek, and then it was translated into Latin. That's called the Vulgate. Okay, so the only people in the fourth century who, once the Bible was translated into Latin, the only people in these regions that could read Latin were in the church. So if the people wanted to hear the Bible read, they had to go to church. So, and they were hungry for this knowledge. There was a desire to be a part of it. So then the priests could read the Bible in Latin and then they would translate in English what they were saying. So you look at how much power that created. The people believed, when you, when you hear things about being spoon fed from the pulpit, this is exactly the system that was put in place in the fourth century where people needed the, the, the church leaders to get the knowledge and the, when they had the desire to try to figure it out. So as time went on and people began to uh, blend and, and, and travel and get more aware about other people's culture, there was also a desire to translate the Bible into other languages. Now, there was much resistance in that, and I don't think it's a, you can, I, I don't think I have to tell you why, because the more times that language would be, the Bible would be translated into other language, the less power the church authorities would have. So here's an example I found during my research. And again, all this will be in show notes. We have show notes for every podcast and they'll be uh, uploaded and you can do your own research on this. But a man named John Wycliffe in the 14th century, he was from England and he was a vocal opponent 
to the privilege and power that was in the church. So in other words, he committed his life to translating the scripture from the Vulgate, the the Latin version, into as many languages as possible, especially English, so that people could read it for themselves. Well, the church wanted to make such a point about him being considered a heretic for doing that, that when he died, after he was after he was dead, dead, he was excommunicated posthumously. And you know what they did to to put a final exclamation point to that? They exhumed his body and they burnt it. Now you talk about the beginnings of fear-based theology right there. If you want to make a point to the people about how fearful they should be for reading the Bible in English because the they, the point was is that even though you can read it, you can't understand it. What better way to do it than exhume a body and burn it, leave the body out to decompose in front of you so that you, you never forget that it is a sin to read the Bible for yourself. And then other people came along after that who still were going to suffer uh, brutally for this, but they started to translate the, the Latin version of the Bible into Hungarian and different languages. And one of them was a, a gentleman named Jan Hus, and he was also declared a heretic and burned at the stake. This just keeps going on and on and on at how many people were burned at the stake for translating the Bible. So when you sit at your home and you're looking at that English version, and you think that it just you just got it from the Bible store or Amazon, think about the history and the people who risked their lives and more than likely lost their lives to begin the journey for us to have the luxury to have that book in our home because the tr- established church fought it vehemently. And in the end, the people won. And can I say a hallelujah and an amen to that? So, and, and that's where I also like to put a um, exclamation point because I think it's important for us to put things in proper perspective when we talk about the separation of not only church and state, but also the importance of accepting our history and, de- and, and creating a line between what is organized religion and what is the mystical side of the Christian faith. Those are two different things. So when we look at what religion can do, and not all of it's that way, but when we start to own the fact that humans made a mistake inside religion, then we can start looking at what we're doing now that can also be construed as a mistake. We have to be able to approach our beliefs in that way. Who are we oppressing? Who are we suffocating with our beliefs because we're staying rigid in them. And that's just an invitation for all of us to always be considering that because, again, it used to be very common to um, to just kill people who they didn't agree with. Now, all of this is important because in the 16th century, when Martin Luther, I just this this brave young man, walked up to the the they think it was the church doors, but there's all kinds of scholarly dis- disagreement, and nailed his 95 thesis, knowing his life was at stake, which was the start of pro- Protestantism. This is the kind of courage it takes to change things in, inside organized religion, and I pray for all of us to always have to walk with that kind of courage, not to be afraid to push back on things that don't make sense, especially if it's oppressing another another human or another set of people, and always ask questions because that is the, the root of Protestantism. It's the root of growth because really our, our spiritual growth is between us and the divine. It doesn't need to filter through an experience of an organized religion. An organized religion can certainly enhance it and bless it with community and support and guidance and wisdom. But when it's all about controlling the individual, we are losing our way. But one of the things that I think is important inside religion that people can, can still adhere to is the ritual. There are times where ritual can enhance your experience. And I think that's important when we look at 
especially this time of year where we're moving into the solstice and we're also talking about um, about Christmas. So one of the stories I would like to share during my during my research was someone who is uh, a, what she calls a practicing pagan. And that is somebody who probably um, in, in her story, she says that she practices Wiccan. Well, Wiccan is an earth-based tradition. It would be considered uh, earth magic or something like that. But it, all it is is someone who follows this path to do basically what their ancestors were doing. And her boss invited her and her colleagues to decorate their cubicles for the holidays. Now, she decided to bring in what is called a pentagram. And if you haven't seen them, it's a five-pointed star. Hollywood has not done this pointed star any good because a lot of times it's been used to show like for devil worship and um, horror stories and things like that. And that's not to say that it can't have some kind of dark connotation because it's one of those, it's one of those visuals that it, it, it's not owned by any religion or belief system. It's kind of like the cross. People can u- wear it all the time and they don't have to be Christian. And they can certainly have radical beliefs that aren't even close to Christian values. So it's the same thing with the pentagram. So she brought in this pentagram to decorate because of the winter solstice. She uses the pentagram like a lot of the, the Wiccans do, which is it's an, it's a, it shows the balance of, of nature with the four seasons and how you, you, your soul fits into that balance. That's how the, this, her section of, sector of Wicc- Wiccan uses it. Well, her boss quietly came to her and said, um, I'm going to have to ask you to take that down. One of my, your colleagues is a Christian and that's making her uncomfortable because that's of the devil. So, she was very upset about this because just based on that Christian's view alone, without talking to the woman at all, without understanding her experience, that the boss arbitrarily made the woman take down the pentagram. To me, this would have been an opportunity for all of the people to come together to look at what exactly was happening during this time. And if you've been following me, especially throughout December, I've been talking about the other holidays that show up during this time and why it's important, the wisdom that we can learn from the different holidays from world religions that sit here for us. So I feel like that was a really um, sad opportunity that was missed for all of them to understand. And now she feels like she can't openly express some of what her beliefs are because she was made to suppress her her beliefs even though he his her boss said bring in quote things for the holidays but what that means is there's this big umbrella of the holidays that everyone assumes is going to filter through the christian faith and um, i'm sorry that that's happening because even the christian can be blessed by understanding the sacred wisdom of the winter solstice. So let me say that again. Now, if you fought, if you've gotten to this point, you're more than likely not a troll just to here to attack me. I think that you're here because you do something I'm saying resonates with you. But sometimes if what we're discussing is filtering through your Christian experience, this can be a little unsettling because I'm inviting you to deconstruct a little bit look at how you're filtering some of what I'm saying and how that might make you feel uncomfortable. But this really is a sacred time, even for the Christian to step out of the just preparing for the Christmas time and looking at what the wisdom and how that can prepare you for the upcoming year and what the winter solstice actually means. Another way of saying that is, y'all, we just need to simmer down a bit. We just need to give everybody a seat at the table and let's see what we can what we can happen what can happen here. Um, and this reminds me too because sometimes people will say, "Well, I'm a pagan," and a lot of times when that was used in my in my Christian heritage, that meant you were of sin, you were of the devil, you were a heretic, you were blasphemous, or something like that. But in reality. What a pagan is, it just means, if you just go look up the the definition, it just means it's someone who holds a belief that isn't found inside an organized religion. That's it, folks. 
So we have globbed on different, different definitions for it that really need to go away because pagan is actually for all of us. Any one of you, if no matter what belief system that you're sitting in, if you're celebrating birthdays, if you have a w wedding ring on, if you are doing anything that comes from another tradition, you are sitting out, you are grabbing in and using pagan beliefs as part of your life values of how you journey through life. You're just not, you're just not seeing it. So it's time for us to embrace the pagan rituals that we bring into our life because we do it all the time. And I think of that, um, if some of you follow me on my social media platforms, especially on TikTok, which TikTok has been known to be a um, the dancing teen uh, app. And I think I've told this story before that many times I heard, really did hear from on a sacred level that I was to go to TikTok. And now if you see, I've had several videos, videos that, that have gone viral. And what's interesting about that is as a boomer, as someone who's from that demographic boomer age, that is kind of funny to me. But there have been times in my videos, either in my videos or in my response, I'll say something about being a boomer. And people will inevitably come back and say, aw, you're not a boomer. You're really nice. Like, okay, so again, there, there's these younger generations who are seeing that I'm labeling me, myself in a, in, a denigra, in a denigratory way when I'm not doing that at all. A boomer is nothing more than a demographic subset of, of what year you were born. And so for me, born in 1961, I'm barely in there because I think it goes to 1963 or 64, but I am a boomer. So I can't, I can't change that label, but isn't it interesting that I think a lot of the Gen, the Gen Zs and some millennials see that as being negative because I think a lot of what you see it happening with some of the rigid beliefs that come from that, from that time that certainly do not, is, is not anything that I, I identify with. So, okay, moving on. Let's start with the word Yule. So we don't use that word very often in our modern traditions, but if you pay attention, that word shows up a lot in some of the Christian uh, traditions. So the, I, again, I'm asking you to look at how paganism comes into your Christian Christmas traditions and in this holiday season. So the word Yule, if you think about some of the Christmas carols, let's, um, let's see how many times you've sung this, Deck the Halls um, with Boughs of Holly, um, See the Blazing Yule Before Us is in that, that Yule is a log. Okay, so see the blazing Yule before us. The Yule is a log and it's a fire because that is going to, hold that for a minute because I'll tell you a little bit about the Yule tide. There's another one that says, have yourself a merry, the, the song, Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas, where it talks about making the Yule Tide gray, uh, gay, make the Yule Tide gay. Okay. So Yule or Yule Tide, it has a traditionally, it means this season of winter somewhere between the winter solstice. So it, it was usually a multi, uh, multi day where they would celebrate for several days during the winter solstice. And so a big bonfire would be um, lit at that time and what it was was a celebration because the light was returning the people knew that we had hit the part where the light the, the the earth would now start moving towards the light and the days would start getting longer so this predates christianity this is this has been going on for a long time so they would pick the biggest tree that had the the biggest logs and that would be the yule log that would burn during this entire uh, season of Yule, this entire celebration, so that they would celebrate the return of the light. And it also symbolized protection for the loved ones, because you have to know that even though this is, this is celebrating that the light is returning, the cold is still going to be among them. They still have a lot of winter to leave, because in, in our uh, modern times, we call this the me now the meteorological winter begins. And they wouldn't have called it that. But we know that some of the coldest days are ahead of us, even though we've hit the place where the light returns. And there's a lot of symbolism in that. So they're also celebrating the return of light, but also asking for protection for their loved ones 
because there's a lot of cold still left to, to endure. So then the Yule log then, once people became more modernized and they had houses and fireplaces inside their home, they would then bring the log inside into their fireplace so that it became more contained. And then later on, as we became more civilized and more reliant on just traditional heating and taking our heat and our survival in the winter for granted, uh, uh, bakers began to make the Yule log cake. And I'm sure you've seen those, and maybe we could put a picture of one in the show notes so that you can see what these beautiful cakes, I've used to make them a long time ago when I used to have time to, to bake, and they are yummy. But And so maybe that'll be a good thing for you to try this year because I think we're all looking for new traditions um, this year. Okay, and one more thing about the, the Yule tradition or the Yule ritual. Pagan traditions still honor that Yule in some capacity. And whether you're, they burn it in their fireplace or they do invite people to come in and have a Yule bonfire, there's still a lot of... Um, beauty and wisdom and sacredness in these rituals that we can find uh, even today. So I'm just going to invite you to just stop there and consider how that has evolved over time and is there a pocket, is there an invitation there for you to expand your experience in December to include a Yule experience because you're singing about it. So in some ways you've claimed it. So how can we then invite our ancestral heritage in by, by doing that? The last thing I would ask is that you not spiral into judgment. Whatever is happening there, there's, we, we, we fear what we don't understand. So this is an opportunity to understand someone who is not necessarily honoring or recognizing the Christmas as being the only reason to uh, bring in the sacredness of this month. They're looking at what has always been here and bringing it into their lives. This is the way we allow our, our common humanity to journey together. This is the way we come along beside each other. That's where we create a table of spirituality that's big enough for all of us. And that's why the winter solstice is for everyone because even if we're going to take for granted that we're going to stay warm and we're going to have food and we're going to survive there is still wisdom for us to pray and hope that the light is going to return to be grateful that the earth has now shifted this is a season that is a time for patience it's like the one symbolism I saw of someone who honors the winter solstice is she said it's like the time of an expectant mother, a, a, a woman who desires to bring forth life. She can sense the spirit of this child in her, but she still must wait. She still must wait. And that's what the winter solstice is because yes, the light, the earth has shifted, the light is coming, but there will still be many more nights of darkness and cold. So for us physically, even though really the changes for us, we go inside more here in the Northern Hemisphere, we go to the wall and we click on the heat, but there is still a wisdom for us to slow down. Just as nature goes to sleep, there is wisdom for us to take a pause, put a blanket around us maybe, grab a cup of warm tea or cocoa or coffee, spend time with loved ones and listen rather than speak. And again, we might have to get creative here because we're still in the middle of a pandemic and it's time for us to figure out what connection means to us. But what we do know that the underneath the ground, the earth is sleeping. Now, even though we can't see anything that's happening, the earth knows, the earth can sense. So when we start, as the days start to get lighter, things are happening there as the seeds begin to germinate, but they know it's not time to come out yet or they would, could be hurt by the cold. 
So what this tells us is that there is wisdom in resting. We simply cannot keep going at these frantic paces, especially here in America, as we, as we tend to do. Rest is necessary for growth that comes to us at a later season. That that incubation period is, is important for all of us. So if we fully understand this opportunity to experience the holiness, the divine presence inside the winter solstice it has nothing to do with a, a religion. It has everything to do with common humanity. That doesn't mean that you are being sinful. It means that you're stepping outside of your, your theology or your dogma long enough to see that you, you have something more in common with your neighbor, with your community, than what you think. So now I'm asking you to move into another level of sacred space. This is where the contemplative, contemplative practice is going to happen. So if you are in the middle of multitasking like I do when I listen to podcasts, just be mindful of what rises up for you as we go through some of this talk. And the reason why I ask you to do that is because when you are being invited for your the heart, the mind, and the soul triad to come and be supported and restored and balanced and, and brought into your reality and be a part of your guiding light, some weird things might happen. And here's a good example of it. One time when I was having a spiritual care uh, client session with someone, after I had asked him a question about what he wanted, he said what came up for him was ice cream. And at first on the surface, that sounded really ridiculous, but I know I've done this long enough to know better. And after we journeyed through this, what that what came up during our conversation was that as a child, some of his most memorable, but more importantly, safe moments, the times when he felt seen and loved was when he was sitting on his front porch with his grandparents eating ice cream. So that moment of remembering that safety, that love, looking in the eye, pausing to be with them, the, the body, the soul invited, you want ice cream. And you might think, oh, that's silly. I'll just go get, go get a quart of Ben and Jerry's and maybe that'll do it. But there is always an invitation to go deeper. So anytime you go into a contemplative practice, pay attention. Everything you think, everything that comes up, is a clue that's inviting you into a deeper conversation of restorative healing, of releasing something, of moving closer to your highest good, moving closer to who you truly are. How are you supposed to show up in this world? So don't, don't rationalize anything that may arrive. But if you have the opportunity to pause here and, po and possibly light a candle, create ritual, grab a blanket, or just go for a walk and listen, there might be something here for you. Because this is about restoration. The solstice is about healing. The solstice is about grieving. The solstice is about sorrow. It's about hope that life returns for us because we're still here to carry on after we've experienced some devastating loss. So let's take a breath together. And now I invite you into the wisdom of the winter solstice. First day of winter. This was a cause for celebration as it heralded in school breaks and gift giving. But this day is so much more than a day, just a day that defines a day in our corporate calendars. Our ancestors would greet this day as the promise of the light returning, 
that the earth would warm again and bring abundance of nourishment, ensuring their survival. This day is the sacred keeper of the shortest day and yet the longest night. Here in December, it also invites us to contemplate all the wisdom held in welcoming the return of the light. Winter solstice does not promise that the earth thaws today. Far from it, beloved. Many days of bitter cold that will test the survival of plants and animals lie ahead. This season is known as meteorological winter because the coldest temperatures will now arrive while the, while the light is returning. This indeed is a paradox. For we see the light. We see it, but we cannot feel the warmth. And yet the light is there, gradually adding minutes to each day, hinting of the awesome healing power of the sun that will arrive in its fullness to warm the lands and all its inhabitants. And yet the earth still sleeps, refusing to awaken just because the light is returning. The earth once again provides the ultimate in wisdom about what the light means, what the meaning of life is, what the meaning of the cold, what the meaning of the darkness is. Because beloved, no matter how hard we try to hold on to what is now, to these things that we cherish and the lives that we so desperately cling to, all things pass away and then are reborn in a new way. And this cycle, this living and losing and birthing and dying is gently held in the turning of the earth away and then back to the sun. Because in our darkest of days, in our deepest of pain, in our greatest of sorrow, beloved, the light eventually comes. Sometimes long before we are ready to face the light. Sometimes long before we're ready to feel the warmth. But we are being called back to live among the living. Because no matter the sorrow, no matter the pain, no matter the tragedy, we are still here, slowly turning with the earth and its inhabitants. We can do nothing except be an observer in this sacred process. Our hearts may be broken and we are feeling hopeless, but look, the light, it's returning. Perhaps it's a sliver of light peeking through the curtains, coming in the form of a touch of a hand or just at the right moment phone call. Then it's a door opening, greeting the light as our feet find movement and our heart desires to be seen as who we are now. Maybe we're just a little bit more fragile. Maybe we're moving just a little bit more slowly. Maybe the light hasn't fully warmed us. Maybe the light can never fully warm us. But one day the earth will feel warm again and our bodies will long to feel the soft grass beneath our feet. The sun is now shining fully as we see the beauty of life around us in those who hold us gently, with a knowing that we may ebb and flow with the wind as memories pierce this thin skin surrounding the heart. But we are here. Yes, beloveds, just look through the curtains. The sun does promise that it is on its way. Yes, the cold is still here, but the light is welcoming and warm. Each day will bring new opportunities for warmth for our bodies and our healing for our hearts. So see the light. Know the healing is coming. Let it be your hope that warmth will soon follow. And blessed be. Take a breath with me. And I pray you have wisdom and insight and healing and growth this winter solstice. Each podcast, I answer a question. And this week, I thought it was appropriate to answer this one. Can I practice witchcraft and still be a Christian? I just answered that. 
Now, I know nothing of dark witchcraft. This is all about the light and what Christian witches do or green witches or white witches. And white is not, not about skin. It's about just the kind of someone working for the good of the whole and bringing practices in that raise their integrity to a higher level and their sacredness and how they show up in the world. So I'm going to leave that right there. If you have any questions about it, go back and listen to this podcast. I want to take a moment to announce that if you haven't seen so already on my website, you can register for my Spiritual Reset 2021. This is your time to embrace that we all need to look to 2021 with just a little bit more of our of hope, but also an eye towards organization and intention and mindfulness. And also be looking the my book, The Holy in the Every Day, which is a 365 daily devotional for the spiritual but not religious, is now out. You can find all this information on my website. Okay, beloveds, I'm honored to be in this space with you, and I pray you receive something. I know I did, because the teacher teaches what she needs to hear. And now, beloveds, go in peace and be at peace. Go in love and may you be loved. Go and know that others are on this journey with you. You are not alone. You are seen and deeply and unconditionally loved just the way you are. Blessings on your week, and I'll see you soon. Thanks for tuning in to another Uncut episode of Spirituality Matters. To submit questions to Rev Carla, email us at spiritualitymatters at revcarla.com. Follow at Rev Carla on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Pinterest for more spirituality teachings. Check out her blog posts at revcarla.com and sign up for email alerts while you're there so you don't miss a thing. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos. Bye for now!